We're in our final section of our course, uh, item 10, design topics. And in this section, we're going to talk about stress concentrations and failure and yield criteria of materials. A lot of mechanics materials courses don't quite get to this point in the class, but, but I've always liked stress concentrations. I've worked on them for a little while. And I think uh, failure criteria is essential to cover because that puts the the cap on the end of when we can apply linear elastic material behavior uh, equations. In other words, Hooke's Law. So I think those two topics are important. And so in this topic today, I'm going to break this up into two parts. One is going to be on uh, the basic background of stress concentrations, what that means and everything. And then the second part will be a detailed example where I work through a problem where we calculate allowable stresses um, and uh, values of stress concentration factors. So the basic idea with a stress concentration is that changes in geometry can cause stress to be higher than calculated by our basic formulas for stress. What I mean by that is if we take a look at this structure, it is uh, has a certain width down on the, the short, the small end, call that maybe W1, and it transitions to a larger width over here through some radius of curvature and that larger width is called W2. Now if we were to take a cut, a free body cut down at the bottom of the structure and draw the stress distribution away from this radius of curvature, that stress distribution would be uniform. Let me draw that over here So we have an axial force applied to this, and we get a uniform axial stress distribution. And uh, maybe we can call this location A. So this would be the stresses sigma A. Now because we go through a radius of curvature, even though this is a larger cross-sectional area over here, there's a certain transition point where we start to get into that change in geometry. It's right near the, the edge of this radius of curvature and we're so close to it that the width isn't really much different. But we're going to see, due to the presence of that radius of curvature, we get a, a non-uniform stress distribution. Okay, so maybe that's location B. So let me sketch that over here on a side view. Okay, so we're just starting to get into the radius of curvature. I have an axial force applied to the end. That's that force P. But the stress distribution, I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit. does something like this. Where the maximum stress is right here. And we're going to call that uh, sigma B. So this is a non-uniform stress distribution. Now, if the resultant force is the same, then the volume of the two stress distributions will be the same. So the fact that the maximum stress at location B is higher than the, the average or the uniform stress means that the minimum stresses at B will actually be a little bit lower than the, the maximum, or excuse me, a little bit lower than the uniform stress at A. So um, that's the basic idea with the stress concentration. Now, stress concentrations occur very frequently in engineering structures. In fact, anytime you have an attachment point of one structure to another, if you drill a hole in something, that serves as a stress concentration. It's a change in geometry. If you have welds, you may have a little bit of an undercut or just the geometry of the weld can cause stress concentrations. 
uh, any kind of transition in geometry can cause these types of stress concentrations. Now the rule of thumb is that the smaller the radius of curvature, the sharper what's called the notch, the higher the stress concentration is going to be. We can visualize stress concentrations by imagining fluid flowing through a structure. Let's uh, make a new page and I'll illustrate that. Stress flow equations and fluid flow equations are, are very similar in uh, uh, mathematically. So if we can imagine a plate, just a, a thin plate with a force on it, the stresses flow from one end to the other in this plate. And if there's no stress concentration or change in geometry, these flow lines are very smooth and straight. However, if we have a hole in our plate and we want to get from one side to the other, kind of thinking of this fluid, here we would hit the edge of the hole and we have to go around it. And likewise on this side. But away from the hole, we have fairly undisturbed flow lines. Uh, intermediate, there's some disturbance. And the place where all those flow lines tend to be bunched up, to be gathered up, is the location of the stress concentration. So these areas right here. So stress concentration factor charts, which we'll, we will study soon, are very good about telling us the value of the stress concentration factor. Uh, but they're not very good for telling us exactly where the stress concentration is going to be. And that comes through experience and imagining this, these flow lines. Now, as I mentioned, as the radius of curvature gets smaller, stress concentration factor increases. And we can kind of see that visually in the example of a elliptical hole. A lot of these flow lines get very bunched up near here. The more of these lines that get bunched up, the more the disturbance there is. So let's write down a couple things that we know now about stress concentration factors. and stress concentrations. So stress concentrations can be visualized by fluid flow in the structure. The place where they bunch up is the place where we'll have the largest stress concentration. Now the other thing that we can say then is that as our radius of curvature decreases, our stresses increase. So as the radius of curvature goes down, sigma goes up. And again, what I mean by the radius of curvature is like in this hole, there's a nice gentle radius of curvature. But here in this elliptical shape, it's a much smaller radius of curvature. Now we need to define a term, and, and I've used this term already. We need to define a term called the stress concentration factor. If we refer to the previous page, we had a maximum stress at B and we had an average stress at A. Our stress concentration factor can be defined as the maximum stress divided by a reference stress. 
So for our particular example, it would be the stress B at uh, maximum divided by our stress at A. Now the reference stress has a special name that you'll often see in stress concentration factor charts. It's called the nominal stress. Some books use the T as a subscript, some don't, but they usually use K for the stress concentration factor, and the T usually means it's a theoretical stress concentration factor or a calculated stress concentration factor. And again, just emphasize that this uh, nominal means reference. And we'll see as we look at stress concentration factor charts that the definition of the nominal stress has to be given in the picture. So on our previous page, our nominal or our reference stress was down at the thin area of the bar. If we had chosen our nominal or our reference stress up at the wide area of the bar at the top, we would get different stress concentration factors because the maximum stress stays the same. So every stress concentration factor chart needs to tell you what the nominal or the reference stress is, otherwise there's no context for determining your stress concentration. So then we can say uh, as the radius decreases, the stresses go up, the maximum stresses, which means that the stress concentration factor goes up. Now in an extreme case, Instead of an elliptical hole, in an extreme case, uh, we can have a very, very sharp slit or a crack in a material. And in this case, we can say that the stress concentration factor, if the radius or curvature of the crack tip is approaching zero, then the stress concentration factor will approach infinity. Um, now, of course, we can't support an infinite stress in the material, so one of either two things happen. The material fractures, or it uh, opens up a little bit and it blunts. So we have a finite, a small but finite radius curvature at the crack tip. Now, cracks are pretty important in different structures, and uh, there's an entire class I teach on that called fracture mechanics at the graduate level. Well, let's take a look at a couple of example stress concentration factor charts. So stress concentration factors, the K or the KT, are often tabulated and presented in graphical form. So this particular graph is from a textbook that I like to use by uh, Roy Craig, Mechanics and Materials. And um, in this chart, what we see on the vertical axis is the stress concentration factor value. On the x-axis, the horizontal axis, there is some geometry factors. And we have to look at the picture to see how those geometry factors are defined. So capital D is the width of the plate, and 2R is the diameter of the hole that's in a plate. So this looks like the, the, the picture that I drew on the previous page, except turned on its side. Well, what we do then is for our particular geometry, we would go here and find uh, 2R over capital D. Let's just do make up an example. Let's say that um, 2R, oops, that 2R is equal to 1 inch. And the, the width of our plate is equal to, uh, let's say, 10 inches. So then we compute this ratio, 2R over capital D. That's 1 over 10. Okay, so that's 0.1. We would go to this chart, and we would go up this line for 0.1. Once we hit the line, we come over here, and we read off our K value. So in this case, from that chart, our K would be, oh, well, let's see, maybe 2.72. Now there's a little bit of uh, subjectivity to reading these charts. Just do the best you can. 
So now with that value of k, then we go back and look in our chart. And just as I wrote on the previous page, we have k is equal to sigma maximum over sigma nominal. That means then if I want to solve for the maximum stress, it's going to be equal to k times the nominal stress. And the nominal stress is defined in this picture as P, the force on the plate, divided by the thickness of the plate and little d. Now we have to be careful. We have to see now how little d is defined. If we look in this picture, little d looks like the width of the plate minus the diameter of the hole. So if we knew what our force was, and we knew the thickness of the plate, we would put those terms in here to find our stress in uh, PSI. So that's the basic idea. And, and as you notice, as this ratio gets larger, so that would be the hole getting bigger in relation to the size of the, the plate, then our stress concentration factor starts to reduce. But as the hole gets very small in relation to the dimensions of the plate, we approach a stress concentration factor of 3.0. And uh, that's a theoretical uh, calculation that can be made using uh, something called theory of elasticity. We can show that for a hole in an infinite plate, we do get a stress concentration factor of 3. And again, these charts don't show us where the stress concentration factor is going to be at. But we know from our fluid flow analogy that they will be on the edges of the hole this way in line with the load. Now the nice thing about theory of elasticity is that not only can we find the maximum stress in the plate with the hole, but we can actually find all the stresses in the entire plate anywhere we want using theory of elasticity. Uh, that's uh, beyond the scope of this course, but again that's another course that I've taught. Well, let's take a look at another example stress concentration factor chart because uh, not all of them look quite like this one. So here's another example of a stress concentration factor chart. And this one looks fairly complicated. It has some basic ideas as to the previous one though, some similarities. Down on the horizontal axis is some geometry term, R over D. And as we see how that's defined, it's the radius of curvature divided by the width of the small end of the plate. So this looks kind of like that sketch that I drew at the beginning. We have a bar in tension, and it transitions from one width to another. Over on the vertical axis, we see the stress concentration factor value. And uh, in this one, uh, we see a lot of different lines. Now what these different lines mean are these correspond to different values of capital D over little d. So the one that I just circled is for capital D over little d of 1.3. So you calculate your R over little d, you go up to the 1.3 line and over and you read the stress concentration vector value and then this is the definition of the nominal stress. So that part is pretty straightforward. For different values of capital D over little d you use different lines. Now there's one uh, one catch. If you notice, they don't have an infinite number of capital D over little d values. Uh, we have 2.0, 1.5, 1.3, 1.2, 1 and so forth. And for your geometry, maybe you end up with something in between those values. Let's just uh, make up something. Let's say capital D over little d is 1.5. One five. So we're in between the 1.1 line and the 1.2 line. Well, what you need to do then is do your best to interpolate between these two lines. It's not a linear interpolation, so you just sketch in your line that you think follows the trend in between the 1.1 and the 1.2 line. 
then you simply enter in your R over D, little d value, go to that blue line, and then you go over and you read your stress concentration factor value. Now, where these stress concentration factor values come from is a variety of sources. A lot of people did experiments in the early 1900s, uh, experiments on stress concentrations are still being conducted for particular geometries. There's uh, theoretical solutions, uh, like I mentioned, theory of elasticity. And then there's a technique called finite element analysis, which is a numerical technique for calculating stresses. So all these different things have a little bit of uh, error associated with them. So when you read these stress concentration factor values, it may be that uh, the factors are only accurate to maybe 10%. So keep that in mind. Uh, the level of precision needs to be appropriate with the calculation that you're making and where the data has come from. All right, so those uh, that gives an example of some uh, a different looking stress concentration factor chart. And so there are all sorts of different stress concentration factor charts. Most mechanics materials books have a handful of them but they can be for bending or for torsion, tension, and then all these different types of geometry transitions. So there's a great big library of them. If you have a very special case, there are references that you can find that have lots of different stress concentration factor charts in them. Right, so a few more notes about stress concentrations. If you're designing a structure and you know that it has a certain value of a stress concentration, then you really ought to take that into account when you design it. Or you should incorporate that into your safety factor for your structure. Now some structures will allow for limited amounts of plastic deformation at notches. This sometimes is a part of the design process in automotive engineering. Uh, but some designs uh, aren't made to allow for any plastic deformation at notches. The stress concentration factor K or KT that we've talked about. If you've noticed, we hadn't said anything about the material uh, out of which it is made. As long as we have this elastic material behavior at the notch, then these charts are independent of the material properties. So these charts are applicable for steel or aluminum or plastic or what have you. These stress concentration factors out of these elastic stress concentration factor charts are independent of the material properties and only depend on the geometry of the structure. Now, there are stress concentrations all around us. Anything that has a load on it and uh, any kind of attachment point causes a stress concentration. So one, um, one example I like to give is if you've ever ridden on an, on an aircraft and you look out the airplane windows, the airplane windows are kind of ovaled. They're very rounded and very smooth in the fuselage. Well, that wasn't always the case before stress concentrations were uh, well understood and, uh, and even people who understand stress concentration factors are, or should know about them will often make errors in uh, coming up with a design that still has stress concentrations in it. There was a, a series of aircraft failures that were the result of having uh, more squarish windows in an aircraft. 
Okay, so they were more like that. Um, and uh, this, you can read about this, and uh, there's even a movie made about this called The Comet, uh, uh, No Highway in the Sky, about the Comet aircraft. This was in the 50s. So the cracks initiated these corners, and they caused uh, great uh, structural failure because the stress concentration factor was quite high. Uh, so there's that. Um, the threads on a bolt can serve as a stress concentration for the bolt. So you want to fully engage the threads. You don't want to have any, any gaps in between your sheets of uh, metal if you're bolting two things together. We've talked about welds. Any kind of undercutting of your weld can cause divots and uh, stress concentrations. Any kind of crack, if you have a fatigue crack, that is a great stress concentration. And all the rest of the deformation will usually happen at the, at the crack in your structure. So take a look around. Stress concentrations are all around us. And uh, see if you can identify when structures are designed to avoid stress concentrations. And I'll give you one example. Our simple tension specimen that we do in the lab has a large diameter and it transitions through a radius of curvature, comes back out to a larger diameter. It's kind of a poor sketch here, but I think you get the idea. Well, on the ends is where we grip the specimen, and the grips really dig into the, to this. So we need to make sure that we account for that stress concentration by having a larger material at the each end of the specimen so that the fact that it digs into it doesn't cause it to break in the grips. Grip failure is a, is a common problem in uh, fatigue testing and one that you want to avoid by proper specimen design. All right, so that will wrap up this discussion and then I'll have a companion video that goes through an example uh, problem uh, similar to what we'd have in our book.